Today's episode is brought to you by BlueChew.com, and now you can try that fantastic product for free. Just pay $5 shipping when you use our promo code WRESTLE. BlueChew is the talk of the wrestling business right now. Find out why right now for just 5 bucks when you use our promo code WRESTLE. Today's episode is brought to you by Turo. Turo is the largest car-sharing marketplace in the world, where you can book any car you want from a community of trusted hosts. From exotic sports cars to pickup trucks, Turo has the widest selection of cars available anywhere for whatever occasion. Download the Turo app, that's T-U-R-O, on the App Store or Google Play or visit Turo.com. Get $25 off your first trip when you sign up with the promo code WRESTLEJUNE at checkout. Terms apply. Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooed it. She pooed it. No, you have me. There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. I ain't scared of shit. Fuck you. Fuck you, Bruce. Ah, the. Hey friends, it's Tony Schiavone. That's right, it's Tony Schiavone, and I'm bringing you now a very special edition of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. We're going to feature the stories behind some of the best matches in wrestling history. But before we do, I need to tell you why I'm on this week and why we have a best of show. Bruce had to have emergency dental surgery. That's right, emergency dental surgery. Can't make this up. First thing I thought of when Conrad said, hey, we need your help this week, was that Bruce got his head stuck up Vince's ass. But that's not the case. He did have to have emergency dental surgery. Now, a couple of things about this. We do understand that when the dentist, and and I'm telling you a true story here now, so bear with me. When, When the dentist went in to get the tooth, which is one of his back molars, it was the most rotted tooth that dentist had ever seen, had ever seen. And here's a funny story. You know how Buff Bagwell has always had his mom do kind of his front work for him? Uh, no, 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 I'm not talking about shaving anything. I'm talking about doing his front work for him as far as making phone calls and letting us know that Buff couldn't make this or Buff couldn't do that. Well, apparently Bruce's wife was the one that called Conrad and said, he had to have this emergency surgery. So it's not your mom, but it's your wife running your life. That's fine with me. Anyway, I uh, hope you'll enjoy this week something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. As we said, featuring some of the best matches in wrestling history. Flair Bischoff, Goldberg, Jericho, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, and maybe even Thompson and Pritchard going at it. That's right. Real life, folks. Real life fights. Even a couple of arguments between a couple of your favorite podcast hosts. So much more on deck. This week, the best of something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. When wrestling gets real. I had to have permission from Bruce's wife to be able to host this show, by the way. Just to keep in line with what's going on with him this week. We start this week with perhaps the greatest in-ring performer of all time, Shawn Michaels. Now, I say in-ring, but according to legend and confirmed by Bruce... Here are a couple of stories involving HBK out of the ring, his backstage fight with Bret Hart, and the infamous incident in Syracuse, New York. So they start going back and forth. At one point, there's a Sunny Days comment. What was the feeling backstage when the Sunny Days comment comes out? You know, I I think that 
people had kind of ch- chosen sides, if you will. You know, there are people in Sean's camp, people in Brett's camp. Okay. And I think that Brett and Sean stirred up both sides. I think they were equally uh, can take credit for stirring the other one up. And I don't think it was appropriate to do on live TV. It was an inside deal for whatever reason that I, I don't like doing inside personal stuff on air and, on, and in public. It it doesn't add anything to the product. It doesn't do anything. It's just petty and, and bullshit. Were those, was that talk really going on backstage? Was there really whispers about a Bret Hart Sonny thing at the time? I'm not asking whether or not it really happened. People were married at the time. I'm saying. There probably was. I mean, to say specifically, I okay. really don't remember. I remember the comment. Sure. I remember the comment. I remember Brett being pretty upset about it. So at some point, this comes to a head, and um, people are yanking hair <laughs> in the back. <laughs> Carry us through the backstage fight. I believe this would have been, I'm guessing, June. I'm not Hartford, ex- Connecticut. I'm freestyling, but you remember. So tell us about this uh, hair incident. Well, it was, I, I wasn't there in the middle of the fight, but from, uh, an eyewitness, you know, they, Sean, they being Brett and Sean had words. Is the eyewitness Jerry Lawler? No. Okay. I was, was Lawler an eyewitness to it? Too? I don't know. I just hear Lawler has the hair. <laughs> he may, uh, I don't know, but, uh, Sean and Brett got into it, and they locked up. I don't know that I, – I really don't even know that any punches were thrown, but they locked onto each other's hair, and they went through a wall, you know, like a false wall that we had up for interviews and stuff. They went through the wall. What time of day is this? Is this early afternoon, or is this right before the show? Or No, this is kind of late afternoonish. Maybe four or five o'clock, okay. something like that. And we were next door in Vince's office, and we're going over whatever the hell we're going over. And, and Sean came in holding clumps of his own hair and talking about unsafe work environments. And we ended up sending both guys home and did the show without them. So at that point, um, was there talk about, I'm not working with that guy anymore. I'm not putting that guy over. Do you remember any of that? No, no. It was two guys who were pissed off. It was emotional and you know, it, it, it spilled over. I mean, it happens. It's a physical business. It's an emotional business. And, uh, when Sean did the sunny days comment, I believe Brett caught a ration of shit from his wife and you know, Hey, you got so many days on the road, you go home to see your family. The last thing you need is it's to, to have, be getting some shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, so Brett was upset and they so, got into it. I mean, it happens. So at this point, uh, there's a, a quick little experiment with, uh, Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels as tag champions, which a lot of people do, just kind of gloss over and don't even remember. Brett's having a series of phenomenal matches during this time, uh, with Steve Austin and really making Steve Austin with uh, figure fours around a post uh, the ambulance, just lots I of think fun stuff. We, I think that the stuff with Bret Hart and Steve Austin is probably some of the best wrestling matches I've ever seen. Guys, let's talk about sex. Good sex. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. So listen up. Bluechew.com. That's blue like the color blue. Blue Chew brings you the world's first chewable with the same FDA approved active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis. So you know, they work. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And since they're chewable, they can work up to twice as fast as a pill. So you can be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now, this just isn't for guys who can't perform. It's for any guy who wants extra function to enhance their performance in the bedroom. Blue Chew is prescribed online and shipped straight to your door in a discreet package. So no in-person doctor's visit, no waiting in line in the pharmacy, and best of all, no more awkwardness. They're made in the USA, and since Blue Chew prepares and ships direct, they're cheaper than a pharmacy. And right now, we've got a special deal for our listeners. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first shipment for free when you use our special promo code WRESTLE. 
Just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's bluechew.com, a promo code Russell to try it for free. B L U E C H E W.com. Blue Chew is the better, cheaper, faster choice. And we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. Of course, on October 13th, that's when Sean got his ass beat in Syracuse and Davy boy is in the back seat. Pretty famous story. We've covered it a couple of times here. Most recently on our Sean Michaels, 95 episode. Did you ever talk to Davy boy about this famous night in Syracuse? You know, yeah. And Davy boy didn't remember much of it at all. Other than he was trapped in the back seat. I couldn't fall and get out. And they, so as you listen to, to everybody's story on it, it was kind of a blur and fuzzy for everybody. And I don't know that that's one of those that someday somebody will have a, uh, sober recollection of everything that took place outside in that parking lot that night. I guess we should mention that bulldog was in the back seat while these dudes are taking turns, beating Sean's ass. He eventually gets out. He being Davy boy pronouns, pal, and drags off with one of the guys who was attacking Michaels. And at that point, Sean's just completely helpless, but then someone tried to leg dive Davy from behind and he wound up being able to lock in a front face lock and is choking him out. When a third guy tries to stick his finger in the left corner of his eye and pull his fucking eye out. So he pulls around, they start fighting. Things are, things are rough. Uh, the next night though, he's working a match and he's got scratches on his face and like a black eye from the, the broken blood vessels. But, um, kid is not hurt because he was in the back passed out and, and they're working a match. Of course, Sean's not there. He's in the hospital. I mean, this is one of those, uh, weird moments where the show must go on, right? Absolutely. The show must go on. And unless, you know, they're, they're not breathing in and breathing out. And if you can work with a black eye, right. And I don't know that, I don't know that Davey had any injuries beyond that and he was able to work. So he worked in your house for October 22nd in Winnipeg. Of course, this is where Sean forfeits the title. The Dean Douglas, I guess we should talk about this. This is a pretty big, pretty big deal in the fall of 88. This is when one of the more famous stories in wrestling comes about the bulldogs are having problems with the Rougeau brothers, specifically dynamite and Jacques. The bulldogs are of course, notorious rivers. And the rumor and innuendo is that Mr. Perfect was involved here and played a rib on the Rougeaus, but the bulldogs based on reputation were blamed for it. And that causes a lot of heat. And when dynamite heard about Jacques going to Vince about the rib that Mr. Perfect did and then blame dynamite, he was furious that Jacques was going to rat him out for something he didn't even do. So he barges into a dressing room where Jacques was playing cards and slapped Jacques across the head from behind, knocking him off the bench. And Brett says Jacques never pretended to be a tough guy, but he had enough balls to stand up for himself. And he lunged at Tom who snatched him in a front face lock, choking him down to the carpet. He let him up, but then Jacques charged him again and Tom cracked him in the mouth before taking him to the floor again. And this time Tom cinched up until Jacques tapped his hand on the floor and surrender. Uh, brother Ray Rougeau arrived on the scene just then and politely asked Tom to just let Jacques up. And he did and told Jacques not to be stooging him off to the office anymore. Now it's worth mentioning that Ray. I believe is a former golden gloves boxing champ. And despite his maybe less than threatening appearance, he's a pretty legit dude and respected for that, but he was injured earlier that week and there was no real opportunity for a fight here. So there's an audience around at this point, of course, and dynamite can't help, but start taunting Ray and Ray says something like, I've hurt my knee. And Tom says, allegedly, yeah, right. Ray, you come and see me when your knees better. I'll be waiting for you. So this story becomes pretty famous. And this is the first of, well, a few confrontations here. What do you remember about this particular story? All right. Well, let's get, you know, a few things clarified here. And in the rumor and innuendo through the years, I think that the legend 
has has grown. And I don't think that Jacques went to the office. It was the ribs were getting pretty rampant and the agents had smartened up Vince and say, hey, you know, this is this is going on. And uh, the boys, the ribs are getting pretty stiff. And I think, you know, something needs to be said because Jacques was being ribbed and because there was a rift there with Jacques and Dynamite. Jacques, I mean, uh, Dynamite assumed, well, Jacques went to the office. So that was, you know, where the assumption began. Hey, you went and stooged me off. He didn't. It was the agents who were going, hey, the ribs are getting out of control. So Vince just didn't want the ribs to get out of control, didn't want things to escalate. And just was like, we'll talk to the guys and let them know we're not going to tolerate any of this shit. There was something with a... a uh, somebody stole Jacques gold chain or something like that. So it, it, it stopped being funny, ha ha ribs and got to be stiffer ribs. Um, just do a meaner things, I guess. So the, the confrontation happened in the, in the dressing room where dynamite came in and confronted Jacques. And I, I wasn't there, but I did hear that Raymond came in and broke it up and that dynamite knowing that Ray's knee was hurt told Ray, hey, when your knee gets better, you know, come find me. I'll kick your ass, too. Now, there's, you know, I was going to say not too many people that or a lot of people. Well, there's a lot of people. I wouldn't fuck with anybody. I don't I'm a pussy. I don't want to (laughs) fight. But if you're even if you're a tough guy, one guy you wouldn't want to mess with is Raymond Rougeau. Raymond was very quiet, nice guy, gets along with everybody. But he's last guy you'd probably want to be in a fist fight with. Uh, had a tough guy reputation, but he never really had to, you know, he didn't have to prove it. He wasn't an asshole about it. Wasn't a bully. It just, uh, so that's how I heard it. That when Ray came in, that knowing Ray's knee was hurt, the dynamite said, Hey, uh, I won't kick your ass right now because your knees hurt, but when your knee gets better, come find me. So that part of it, you know, and that was confirmed by a lot of people. Well, they start working. The, the, the foundation is working nightly with the Rougeaus and it's hard not to notice that they're taking this ribbing from the bulldogs. Personally, this is all from Brett's book. He writes, and every night Tom made a point of asking Ray, how his knee was, I warned Tom to ease up. And then a TV in Toledo, Tom was wrapping up a conversation with Pat Patterson. They're the two in the l- last two in the lunchroom as they got up and walked out the door. Jacques sucker punched Tom, knocking all of his front teeth out. As Tom bent over, dazed and stunned with blood pouring out of his mouth, Jacques drilled him until bad news intervened to save him. Meanwhile, Pat jumped around like a hysterical woman. The Rougeaus had their bags waiting by the back door and bolted before Tom even realized what was going on. A famous, famous story here. What do you remember about when he finally retaliated? I saw the whole thing. I was on a payphone. Uh, it was right outside of catering, and I was on the phone. And I noticed again when you go back and you realize everything that was taking place. Jacques and Raymond were hanging around outside of catering when Dynamite came out. Jacques nailed him from behind, and it was a punch from behind. And they turned around, and Jacques nailed him again. There were quarters or nickels or dimes or whatever there were there were coins all over the floor and it's like what the fuck is going on and i remember dynamite being bent over he had his hands up and they it wasn't like in front of his face he just had his hands up trying to block whatever the hell was coming in um guys started coming around and shit pat tried to get in between them and you know like guys break it up break it up And Raymond was just on the outside, making sure that nobody jumped in. He didn't get involved in it. Um, It was a bad, it was, it was an ugly scene. Put it that way. Uh, Jacques knocked out Dynamite's front teeth and it was a lot of blood and it was a mess, but they did not, they did not leave after that because Vince had a meeting with them, uh, got everybody together that day, had Hulk in there. And, you know, got everybody together that day and made them meet and say, hey, I'm not going to have any of this nonsense and bullshit. Why was Hulk? Brother, why can't we all just get along? 
Because Hulk was, yeah, Hulk was the locker room leader at the time. He was, he was the big star. He was the main guy. And he had Hulk in it. So, but he, he got everybody together that day and he, he sent, you know, he sent everybody home and all that shit, but yeah, it was a bad scene. Um, it was written. The Bulldogs had to leave the next day for a WWF tour of France. Vince called Tom in France and offered to pay for his dental work, but he insisted that when he came home, he wanted both Tom and Davey to meet him in his hotel room at the San Fran TV tapings. He'd have the Rougeaus there along with Pat, and he wanted them to all make peace. He told Tom that if he and the Rougeaus carried on the feuding, he'd hold back the royalty checks and pay-per-view checks and the pay from his French tour. So Tom grudgingly accepted Vince's orders, and it was uh, a sad surprise to see most of the wrestlers when Tom, our legendary pit bull, basically had his balls cut. Those of us who really knew him realized that getting his teeth punched out was the beginning of the end for him. Dynamite was good for his word when he shook hands with the Rougeaus in front of Vince. So that's the way Brett remembers it and sort of thinks that's really the beginning of the end. Would you agree with that? It was the beginning of the end. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, the uh, the order of things, I think, is a little mixed up because Vince got everybody together then. Okay. When the Bulldogs went over to France, I think it was the the bravado of Dynamite saying, by God, when next time I see Jacques Rougeau, I'm going to kill him. And Dynamite cutting the promos and Vince was like, no. Next time you see him, you're not going to kill anybody. And that was, again, when he got everybody together and said, hey, this, this ends. It's over. And he did He did pay for uh, Dynamite's teeth and told him he would take care of that. But it was kind of Dynamite's bravado. And when he got over there talking about, you know, this isn't the end of it. I'll get my revenge. And Vince just didn't want to have any of that. And so when they got back again, it's like this ends. Guys, this is over. There's not going to be any receipts. You know, the, the ribbing and the bullshit got us here. It all ends over. Well, let's keep it going here because uh, we're not done. Uh, Brett said on November 24th, he even sold talking about dynamite for both of them at the Bulldogs last match at survivor series and even worked a couple of high spots with Jacques. He simply couldn't afford not to, but he brooded terribly about it. The match he's referencing here is the Bulldogs teaming with the Hart Foundation, the Powers of Pain, the Young Stallions, and the Rockers to take on the Rougeau Brothers, Demolition, Brainbusters, Bolsheviks, and Conquistadors. Uh, we're probably going to cover that one soon, I guess in November. Chat me up here. Last match for the Bulldogs and the last match ever for Dynamite Kid and the WWF. What went down? Why did it end? I think that they were, they had run their course. And after the, you know, after the deal with Jacques, Dynamite wasn't, he was not the same guy. You know, he didn't walk around with the chip on his shoulder. He didn't walk around, you know, the same tough guy that he had been prior to that. Plus you had, you know, the Bulldogs had been there for a little while. And they had an opportunity to go back to Japan. They had some dates that were still on the table that they wanted to honor and see if they could maybe go and not work as much, go back to Japan and do that for a while. So it was a, it was an easy out, put it that way for them to be able to exit stage left and go do something else and still save face a little bit. They wind up in stampede for a little while. And, uh, in May of 89, they did some stuff in uh, all Japan as well, uh, through 89 and 90, but in, in May of 89, the bulldogs split up and then start a feud with each other, but they're still together in all Japan because you know, no internet and whatever July 4th, 89, that was a big deal because Davey is involved in a serious car accident, which included Chris Benoit, Ross Hart, and Jason, the terrible. Apparently Davey wasn't wearing a seatbelt and had his head slammed into the windshield and then was thrown 25 feet to the pavement. You ever hear about this wreck? Yeah, it was, it was a bad one. And there were legends of the North, the Northwestern trips and some of the car trips those guys took. And this was an exceptionally bad, uh, bad accident. And 
Davy getting hurt, you just heard about it. And everybody was just thanking God that everyone was alive after the accident. So we were just thankful that everybody, you know, for the most part, you know, was okay. And Davey ends up with his head split open and getting several stitches, but it could have been a whole hell of a lot worse. He got, he got thrown through the windshield and, and took a hell of a bump, but yeah, we all heard about it and it just, uh, you knock on wood and you thank God that uh, everybody's alive and okay. For years now, you've heard us talk about hymns here on the show and how they're helping guys look their best. For hymns.com is a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. And we've had tons of our listeners reach out to us on social media and tell us how For Hymns is working for them. And you should get on board the train. Thanks to science, baldness can be optional. No more awkward in person doctor's visits or long pharmacy lines. For Hymns connects you to real doctors online. It's completely confidential and discreet. Just answer a few questions and a doctor will review. Then if they determine it's right for you, they can prescribe you medication to treat hair loss ship directly to your door order. Now, and my listeners can get started with the hymns, complete hair kit for just $5 today while supplies last and subject to doctor's approval restrictions apply. See the website for full details. And this could cost hundreds. If you went to the doctor or a pharmacy somewhere else. So go to four hymns.com slash WWE. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash WWE for hymns.com slash WWE. JBL John Bradshaw Layfield is known for being among the toughest in wrestling history, but even the toughest can lose a fight or two once in a while. And it was Joey Styles pulled from WrestleMania 22 and Backlash 06 because his commentary abilities or to build the ECW relaunch. Vince was looking at, at that time. He was looking to do the ECW, wanted to get Joey off of the off of that and uh, felt that if you take him away when he returns for ECW, he'll mean that much more. Where would you rank Joey all time as a commentator in professional wrestling? I think people all often put over, you know, Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross and Lance Russell and Gordon Soley and even Bob Cottle, but you'd never hear anybody put over Joey Styles. You know, I'll put over Joey Styles for his emotion and Joey Styles for his passion in the way that he called the ECW. Joey Styles was as much responsible for the ECW phenomenon as anybody is, is the talent or Paul or anybody else because people identified Joey's, Oh my God. And his unique style of calling the action with that brand. So Joey was very responsible for ECW success. I think overall is a play-by-play guy. You're going to laugh at this, uh, but he is in the top five. And I, I, I wouldn't have put Bob Cottle in there. I didn't think Bob Cottle was a good play-by-play guy. Uh, you, you have to place. And I have to put Vince in there, too, uh, because Vince told a good story. But you got, you know, JR, you got Vince. I put Tony up in there, and I'd put Gordon, and I'd put Joey. Well, oh, so there you go. Michael wants to know there's rumor and innuendo about JBL and Joey styles getting into a physical confrontation. Any details? No, I wasn't on the flight. It was an over, it was an overseas flight. I think it was a tribute to the troops where JBL was ribbing Joey styles. And then Joey styles punched him. That was about it. Much to do about nothing. Allegedly, you know, uh, he, he felt like JBL sort of crossed the line with a comment about his family. He popped him. Nobody expected Joey to fight back. And, uh, it was sort of over after that. Right. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Like I said, much to do about nothing. <laughs> you know, Joey was fine. Bradshaw was fine. Everybody's like, yay. And it was over. And this is not going to be comfortable for you. So I'll apologize in advance, but there's no way to tell the story without just telling the story. JBL and other SmackDown wrestlers come onto the balcony to watch this ECW one night stand show. And this is in the middle of the show. They cut a promo, of course, the biggest of which being from JBL during Paul Heyman's promo. He tells JBL that he's the, he's only champion because triple H didn't want to work on Tuesdays. And at the end of the show, there's a big brawl in the ring between ECW and WWE guys. And during it, JBL legitimately busts up blue Manny's face. 
And there's a lot of heat on JBL after this. Wade Keller would write the locker room sentiment seemed decidedly anti JBL quote, JBL's a dick and he has a huge ego. A lot of people backstage enjoyed Paul putting him in his place during his promo. And another ECW wrestler says, what the fuck do you prove beating up blue Meanie?" and JBL accompanied by Orlando Jordan did step onto the bus after the event and told a large group of ECW wrestlers that he loved the show and really appreciated what they did. Some thought it was a odd gesture, but others saw it as JBL trying to save face. In any case, JBL was consistent in saying that he absolutely loved the event and that it was his first ECW show ever. Before we talk about what happened, I want to read you what blue Meanie wrote on his MySpace. It is 2005 after all, when this happens. It's no secret that Bradshaw never liked me from my first day in the WWE to my last. And Meany also shares that during the skirmish, JBL is yelling at him about things Meany had said about him on the internet. And Meany claimed that his unflattering words had all been a part of the show. And Meany said in recent years that he thinks he got heat because he was on a flight and sitting first class while the rest of the guys were in the back. And he was told if this ever happens again, give your seat to a vet. And Meany said he honestly didn't know to do that. And he says he didn't know this punch was coming, but he saw JBL staring at him during the stare down. And he said two nights before at the hardcore homecoming, he was hit in the head, uh, by Sandman and he had to get eight staples in the back of his head. And he said the first time JBL hit him, he hit him right where he got the staples. So Meany turned around and JBL put a shirt over his head like a hockey punch and started throwing live rounds. Meany says he tried to grab a headlock to stop the punches and they ended up getting separated. And he says when they got backstage, JBL came over and said that Meany was talking about him on the internet. And Meany said he thinks JBL was referring to when he was released in 2000. He called JBL a bully. And JBL, in an interview with WWE.com after that, said the incident with Meany had nothing to do with any old heat. I don't even know the guy. I couldn't care less about the fat little kid. On the July 4th SmackDown, Meany would pin JBL after Batista interfered. And during the match, Stevie Richards hit JBL hard as a motherfucker in the head with a chair. And in an interview afterwards, Richard said JBL had it coming. This is an incident that got a lot of attention online. And a lot of people thought the SmackDown chair shot was retribution, but boy, what a fucking weird twisted web. This was, you weren't there. You had the night off, but you certainly heard about it. Was the consensus that JBL just maybe drank too much in the balcony and let it go too far? Or what's the, what's, what's the thinking in the office? You know, well, not only was I not there that night, I wasn't there for the subsequent TVs afterwards. So I'd had that whole week off. So by the time that I even got back, it was a non-issue and everything had kind of blown over. But the scuttlebutt, I, I guess the, the rumor and innuendo was that basically they got in there and John got hit from behind, turned around, thought Meanie had sucker punched him. So he fucking went after Meanie. Uh, how any of that happened, don't know, don't care. Uh, it was brutal uh, after seeing Meany's uh, gashes afterwards. And he apparently had been busted open by Sandman a couple days before and had a nice fresh wound there as well. So not cool in any way you look at it. And it's just, uh, it ain't fucking ballet, but. I do remember seeing the chair shot like I, and even going back to this day, um, I think I saw that, that whole fight scene with JBL and Meanie maybe one time just in, in watching the show over. And I do remember the chair shot with Meanie and I remember John coming back and, and being totally cool with it. I'm like, okay, next, but shit happens. I think that the, the media and everybody else will blow it more out of proportion than the participants will. And I think JBL and Meany are cool to this day, but again, misunderstandings, people say shit, do shit and shit happens sometimes, man. It's life. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm glad that, you know, everybody's on good terms now and that everybody's sort of kissed and made up. But when you, if you were on the outside 
and you were a fan and you're seeing all this and hearing all this, wouldn't it be easy to understand and sort of get with the narrative that, uh, maybe this JBL guy's a, a bully in real life. Not if I don't know him again, uh, you know, having been part of, you know, rumor, innuendo, perception and speculation of things that just simply aren't true. When people will give their perception of me or say things about me that have never met me, that have never spent 30 seconds even saying hello to me, or maybe they did s- say hello to me for five seconds when I was in the middle of something else, or maybe, uh, this was great. One time I, I was at an appearance and I had just gotten word that my wife was rushed into the emergency room and someone came up and wanted to take a picture. And I took the picture and the guy says, he goes, well, can you smile at least? I said, I'm not in the mood to smile right now. And, and it actually made it onto one of your friend's dirt sheets about what an asshole I was when no one knew, because I remembered the situation. I remembered the whole fucking deal because of the phone call that I was on. When I got off, this guy, you know, came up. So people don't know. Uh, they've never taken the time to get to know them and, and they probably never will because of the lives that, that we live, the lives that John lives. So I don't think that's fair a lot of times, but I can see where people based on the information that they have coming from these different people, also a lot of who haven't been around or who don't like him for whatever reason. Um, I can see where they can come to that conclusion. But it's not fair. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, cryptos, all commission free. While other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, Robinhood doesn't charge any commission fees. So you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. Plus, there's no account minimum deposit when you get started. So you can start investing at any level. The simple, intuitive design of Robinhood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. Very easy to understand charts and market data and place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. You can also view stock collections such as 100 most popular with Robinhood. You can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio, discover new stocks, track your favorite companies and get custom notifications for price movements. So you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving listeners of something to wrestle a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up right now at wrestle.robinhood.com. And the winner here is then going to get a shoot match with Kurt Angle. And unfortunately for Chris Naraki, he wins the competition and Angle pretty much throws him around the ring for about 30 seconds. And I believe even broke one of his ribs in the process. Uh, And then he pins him before we go on. What are your memories of that? Any, any heat on Kurt? I mean, obviously accidents happen, but this is interfering with a television show. No, you know, there, there was no heat on him. It was, he did what he was supposed to do. The, the issue was that they wanted to have interaction with the WWE talent. So Paul Heyman wanted to have, and we've talked about this on, on the Heyman show, but Paul wanted to have Nunzio. Okay, who's legit um, shoot wrestler, uh, very tough kid, but he's he's smaller. He trained with Billy Robinson, and he is a really tough guy. But he wanted Nunzio to stretch all the guys, and that's how it started out. So from there, it went from Nunzio to Big Show to Mark Henry to Kurt Angle to all these different people. So as we're doing this, we're sitting there, and I said, well, what you have to do is uh, I went old school. This is where I did get involved because I went back to the Gene Anderson and style of training guys. So one thing that Gene used to do was he would make guys run the steps for hours and he would hit them with, uh, broom handles and shit like that. And then once they ran the steps, he would make them do a thousand squats and gun go run the steps some more and then hit the ropes back and forth. And then, uh, all this other shit. 
before they ever locked up, before they ever did anything. And then once they were blown so sky high that their legs were spaghetti, then the guy would beat the shit out of them. Okay, so okay, now let's wrestle. And the wrestler, of course, being he would be fresh, ready to go, and he would stretch the guy. The people that came back from that were the ones that really wanted to be in the business. The ones that couldn't handle that, that's how they would weed them out. Not saying that's a good way to do it or not. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's a good way to do it in today's day and age. But for this competition, my idea was, I said, well, we need to run them. We got to blow them up first. So we took them back and there was a ramp uh, backstage and we made them run sprints up and down the ramp. Then we made them do these squat thrusts and all this other shit. But we, we had them sprint uh, forever until they were dragging. Then once they ran the sprints, we took them in and fed them fettuccine Alfredo. So the contest in there was uh, you got to eat so many bowls of this heavy, creamy fettuccine Alfredo. So now you're stuffing your face with fettuccine Alfredo. And the only thing that they had to drink, they had like two, uh, not gallons, but the next smaller size of milk that you had to wash it down with. So you had to eat what was in front of you. You had to eat the fettuccine Alfredo and you had to wash it down with the milk. Now, and one of them may have been buttermilk as well. So now you've been running like crazy. You've eaten all this pasta, drank all this milk. Now let's go run again. You run them some more. We've made them do squats. Now it's time for them to go out and do the competition thing. So now they got to do the, the squat thrusts and all that other crap. And the idea was to blow them up. Well, watching all this shit, I noticed Daniel Pewter, he wasn't sprinting. He was just kind of jogging and he, he wasn't going hard at all. Uh, plus he didn't eat, he wasn't eating his pasta. And I told Johnny, I said, Hey, I said, this motherfucker over here, you know, he's not eating and he's not sprinting. Uh, he's conserving his energy. So, you know, they got on him and all this shit. And I don't know that he ate all of everything he was supposed to eat because we had a time constraint too, that we had to get through and we had to get these guys done. So they get up there and the one kid, one kid won and Kurt stretched him. So that, that all happened before they ever even got to the air, but it wasn't done in a way old school. It was guys, guys were cheating and they were letting them slide. Well, after this, uh, the segment where Kurt's throwing Chris around, he challenges he gets on the mic and, and challenges everybody who's still in the competition on the outside of the ring and says, Hey, if anybody wants to challenge me, just step right in. And pewter quickly raises his hand and gets in the ring. You guys knew he had a wrestling background and an MMA background. Are you in the back? Are you in the gorilla position? Do you think, Oh shit, this isn't a good idea. It was a terrible idea. We told Kurt, you do the one guy and that's it. Nobody else. Okay. And we even, sh we even showed him, you know, this guy hasn't been running. This guy hasn't been running. This guy didn't eat his pasta. I said, don't fuck with them. I said, leave them alone. I said, just, uh, I said, if they, if they win and you blow them up in the ring and, um, I said, but you do the one guy and you get out. That's it. Well, Kurt kept going and, Kurt, you know, challenged and, and made, made the challenge. And this guy sitting there and Kurt was so mad that somebody would, would want to face him. And at this time, you know, Kurt has just stretched this big 300 pound guy, which takes a lot out of you. And Kurt wasn't the Kurt angle from 1996 at this point either. So yeah, it was, it was Kurt. Wasn't supposed to ask anybody uh, who else wants me because then it makes him look like a dumbass if he doesn't take anybody. And then he took the guy and the guy got him in an arm lock and then Kurt had to pin him. But it was just, 
it was shitty all the way around. And, and, and the point is, we never should have put ourselves in that position. So let's talk about the actual situation. Angle and Pewter are wrestling for position. Angle takes Pewter down. No surprise there. But in the process, Pewter gets Angle and a Kimura. And while Pewter is on his back holding Kurt's arm in the move, Angle's attempting a pin. And one of the two referees in the ring, Jimmy Corderas, quickly counts three to end the match, despite the fact that Pewter's shoulders were not down on the mat. And he got a bridged up at two. Now, Wade Keller would put in the torch from backstage. Gerald Briscoe had the ref through his earpiece, count a fast pin, recognizing the situation angle was in angle leaped up, got in Peter's face, asked him what he was thinking, and then went into a trash talking spiel that was meant to look like a veteran browbeating a greenhorn. But in reality, angle was reeling from the realization that he almost got embarrassed in front of a full arena and his colleagues. And everyone sees him as, you know, the creme de la creme. I mean, he's the guy with the real sports credentials. Chat me up here. Do you remember Briscoe giving the order to Corderas to count the pin, recognizing that angle was in trouble? Well, here's the whole idea behind it though. You had an amateur wrestler and it was amateur rules. And that was what Kurt was out there doing, but you had dumb fuck referees it didn't know what an amateur pin was. An amateur pin is not a three count, right? An amateur pin is if you're, t- if both shoulders touch the mat, you're out. That's the pin. It's that quick. Um, so the fact that he bridged out on three, who the fuck cares? He was pinned. He was down. So he was pinned and the referee didn't know any better. And the, I don't think, but at the same time, and I'll defend the referees here. I don't think anybody thought it would get to that point ever. Um, so it just was, it was ill-conceived. It was uh, ill-executed. And Kurt put himself in that position. And the kid, I mean, the kid had his arm locked. If the kid wanted to break his arm, he could have broken his arm. You know, I think that's what is sort of lost on everybody. If this was a real MMA fight, Kurt would have already tapped, but he's in this spot where he can't tap like that. That's not what this segment's supposed to be. So he's not going to tap, but as you said, I mean, if you really wanted to, he could have cranked that thing and it would have been a bad day for Mr. Angle. Yeah, I think he could. I think he had it locked in pretty good. And, and again, you know, I don't, you would have had to break Kurt Angle's arm before you tap. He's just that tough and he's that good, but why? Why, why put one of your top guys in that position? And that was my, that was my argument. And that was my bitch that I didn't like putting Kurt in that situation at all. Angle told people backstage afterwards that his hand went numb after the scrimmage with Chris. And that's why he had a tougher time taking Peter down. And Keller would write that there wasn't any heat on Peter for doing what he did, saying that everybody knew he could have injured angle, but he didn't. And there were a lot of guys in the back, according to Wade, who felt bad for angle, considering that he was out there in bully mode, but got shown up numbness or not quote, Kurt was working stiff with them. So Peter went into survival mode says one WWE insider. That's what he is trained to do. And what he should have done. He showed balls and guts end quote. So chat me up. What was, what's your read on the situation backstage? Peter comes through the curtain. Kurt comes through the curtain. What are people saying or thinking? Well, Kurt was pissed off and I was pissed off at Kurt. Um, I was pissed off at Paul Heyman. I was pissed off at Paul Heyman for getting in Kurt's ear and pumping him up so much that that's what Kurt felt that he needed to do. And it just made every, it it made the, the business look bad. It made Kurt look bad and there was, there was no need for it. Uh, It was my anger, I guess is the best way to put it. So I was pissed off at Kurt for letting it go that far. I was pissed off at Heyman for getting him riled up. I was pissed off at pewter for, uh, fucking getting in there. Uh, I had a lot of pissed off to go around, but at the end of the day, it was our fault. It was our fault for allowing it to happen. And we should have, uh, going back to, to Lauren and those guys, man, 
if you're going to blow them up, blow them up. Don't half-ass do it. And don't come in thinking you forget a shooter, a guy that is trained to, to beat you and to hurt you. Okay. And, and that's what Kurt Angle was for so many years. Then we, we took that away from him and we taught him how to dance and we taught him how to work with people and not hurt them. So he's not in that mode. He's not in that killer instinct mode. Now you've got a kid who's coming from the world of shoot and hurt and do what you have to do to win who they have not taught how to dance yet. And you put those guys together. Yes. Kurt, in my opinion, for many, 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 many years was probably the baddest human being walking the face of the earth and the toughest son of a bitch I've, I've ever seen. However, at this time, man, he was broken down. He was, he had nagging injuries and he, he wasn't that same guy. And to put him in the ring with somebody that was hungry and someone that had been doing nothing but that, it's not fair to Kurt. And it's not, fa- it's not fair to us. And it's just wrong. And it was a bad call. So I don't blame Peter for what he did. Fucking go out there and make a name for yourself, kid. Here's an opportunity. Go make a name for yourself. Why not? That's what he thought he was supposed to do. Do you think this uh, incident hurt Kurt's rep backstage at all? No. No. Kurt has said that, you know, this is a very awkward situation. His neck is so bad he can't even do five push-ups. But one of the ideas was that Vince wanted him to wrestle all of the finalists and he didn't think he was worried about pewter at all, but he was more concerned about the two big guys. He says at the time he only weighed 207 pounds and his body had started to deteriorate. His neck is just killing him. And he says when he wrestled Chris, that front headlock, he got him in and pushed him over. He jammed his head into the canvas. So his hands go completely numb. And he's just trash talking and opened his mouth and says, who else wants some? And then there you go. That's how this whole pewter thing came to be. It is interesting because Kurt would write in his book. The whole thing was, it wasn't supposed to be an ultimate fighting contest. It was a wrestling match, but there was supposed to be a submission, but he was a moron. And he put his back on the mat and it wasn't supposed to be a three count. It's supposed to be a one count, like an amateur wrestling. And let me interrupt there. And and that was, and that was the fail safe on everything. Because when we talked to everybody beforehand, it's like, it is amateur rules because there was no doubt, no matter who it was, that that Kurt couldn't pin him. No, that Kurt could pin him. Right, right, right. So that was the fail safe on everything. So that's why, you know, when, when the referee counted three, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. It's, it's a one slap and it, and it's out. So we had talked about that and that was the fail safe that no matter what happened, everybody felt confident that Kurt could get him on their back and that Kurt could pin him. I do think it's fun though, that you're fired up at the referees for doing a three count. But they're in a professional wrestling ring at a professional wrestling show, wearing a professional wrestling outfit where they've been doing training. amateur shit. <laughs> and you're like, you fucking dumbass, doing exactly what we've sold tickets for and you've done your whole life. Yeah, doing a goddamn. Re- hey, 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 we're doing a reality show inside of goddamn entertainment show with an entertainer and a shooter who's real, who goddamn, we want real rules, motherfucker. What's confusing for you, shooter boy? You know, that's shit. What, that's what's fun to me, though, is, is realistically, if he would have done a one count, the crowd's going to be like, well, he didn't pin him. That was only one. Because we, as wrestling fans, we're sure. at a pro wrestling show. We've been trained to believe. A oh, pin is three. He kicked out at one or whatever. So anyway, it's just silly. It's, it's fun to hear you silly. get, but my favorite part is you're fired up. But you I am. I'm fucking hot. That is so good. Motherfucker. Um, I guess we should talk about the end here, but before we do, let's talk about Paul Heyman, because I had never heard the story when you were saying a little earlier about the whole Kurt angle incident that it was Paul who was in Kurt's ear, getting him fired up. 
how much blame do you think Heyman had? I mean, had Heyman not gotten in his ear and really firing Kurt Angle up, would he have made the secondary challenge to Pewter? Would any of this have even happened? Had had Kurt not got in, had Heyman had not Paul gotten, not got in Kurt's ear, Kurt wouldn't have even been out in the ring in the first place. I see. So it was, it, in my opinion, it was. It was Paul who got Kurt fired up to go to Vince to demand to be in that spot and convince Vince that he was the one to be in that spot. Peter says some of his best memories of OVW are when Paul came down and they got to work together. He said he really likes Paul and he's super blessed to have Paul in his life, even all this time later. Tony Schiavone back with you here on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard as we go and take a look at some of the stories behind the legends in pro wrestling. Again, if you just joined us or if you just want to hear the story again, Bruce had to have emergency dental surgery. His dentist said his back molar had to come out the most rotted tooth the dentist had ever seen. Yeah. Remind me not to kiss Bruce. Uh, not all fights have to be of a physical nature, and sometimes even the best of friends can have a disagreement. Something to wrestle has no shortage of moments where Conrad and Bruce Get into it. And here's a couple of the most memorable of those moments. The Alabama Dream and Brother Love get into it. A little bit about a European tour involving Hulk Hogan. And another with Conrad sticking up for one of Bruce's most frequent targets of insults, Mr. Thompson's beloved ECW. Dave writes a long editorial about how the wrestling business, uh, much like a lot of entertainment business, has a lot of folks who are really good at their craft and maybe even better than others who live permanently in the shadow of more charismatic people without the same level of talent. And he kind of says that that's the situation here because Hulk Hogan is a proven draw and the WWF needs his box office juice just to maintain its position in the entertainment world. So he feels like Hogan has a lot of bargaining chips on his side as to what he gets and when he picks his spot to return. And uh, even though the majority of the reaction was pretty negative about the direction changed, Dave agrees it was the right move for business this summer. And you could argue that it was the only move you could make short term. Uh, But others would say, well, you need to be building long term. So I know you well enough to know that you agree with all of that. So just state that clearly for the record. Repeat after me. I, Bruce Pritchard, agree with everything Meltzer wrote here. No, I I agree with part of it. What do you disagree with? with It was, it, it was what needed to be done and it was, but it was what needed to be done for the international tour. And it was the right move. You, You realize how stupid that sounds when you say it out loud. Well, that's what it was. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. We did it so Hogan would be the champion on the international tour. Why'd you need that? Because it was his last raw overseas. No, it gives a fuck. Sure they did. Different right. time, different place. Let's run through that. You just spent the last hour telling me how fucking over Bret Hart was internationally and how huge he was in Europe. So if that's the case, why the fuck do you need Hulk Hogan? Was over as Brett was, Hogan was over more, and it was Hogan's. It was Hogan's farewell tour, and it didn't happen. What do you mean it didn't happen? Well, he left right. At, I mean, he wasn't the champ. He lost it to King of the Ring. I. But before that was the international tour. That was right that, after but, WrestleMania is when we did the international tour, and that was Hogan as the champion. Then Hogan came back at King of the Ring and dropped it to Yoko. But it was Hogan's farewell UK tour. That was the whole reasoning behind it. So all that stuff earlier about Bret Hart being huge. Walking on water, he was huge. So they had a $320,000 gate before they even went, before WrestleMania. But you felt like you needed Hulk Hogan. Do you, I mean, do you realize how dumb that sounds? No, I don't think it sounds dumb at all. It, it add, it's adding even more value to it and allow you to raise prices. And If the tickets are already sold, out, how, how are you raising know. prices? You raise prices with Hulk Hogan and just added more value. Give him something else. Uh, I, I, the tickets are already sold. But you're adding value. 
how can you raise prices to something where the ticket's already sold? Well, you raise prices with Hogan going over. Listen, you, you stupid fuck. There value. aren't any tickets no, there. Listen, we if added the tic- value after the fact. You bought your tickets. Now you got Hulk Hogan, right? Yeah. So the people show up with their tickets so and they say, up, well, so you bought you it. With- all, you get Hogan as champion, which is what they wanted to see. I understand. And that's what we gave them. But you're saying you raise prices. We did initially raise prices. Yeah. With Hogan's return. But the t- I just said that you already had the gate. Like you do this right. I didn't know you were talking about the tour the next week. Cause that makes even fucking less sense because you've already had the tickets on sale. True. But we wanted to give them added value and have Hulk tour as the champion. Why does that matter? If you've already because sold that's three what Vince wanted, there's the answer. I'll take that one. Stop with all your other shenanigans bullshit well, that doesn't no, make any sense. Reason, you want the reasoning behind it. I'm giving you the reasoning behind it. Well, we can raise prices. It. How do you raise prices from that already sold? Give me more money. Prices at the beginning. Give me, you give me more money, dude, dude, dude. That's what I do. I make money. How could you raise prices in the beginning if they don't know that Hogan's going to be championed? Well, you knew Hogan was going to be there. You give them added value by him being there as champion. So you put the tickets. Got a championship match. This is so dumb. <sighs> Mike awesome gets an offer from WCW and signs while he is the current WCW or ECW champion. Uh, but now he is a contracted WCW wrestler, but technically the ECW champ. So somebody has this idea, Hey, forgot to get the belt off of him. Let's let a WWF guy be a WCW guy for the ECW belt at an ECW show. That seems like the most ridiculous idea ever, but it's what happened. How did it happen, and whose idea was it? Well, it was Paul Heyman's idea, and Paul looked at it simply as he had lost Taz, and now he's losing his champion in Mike Awesome. What better way, you know, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, but what better way than to take the guy that went to New York have him come back home that he left and have him beat Mike Awesome for the championship. And there was a level of trust there with Paul, with Taz. Um, you know, and as I say that, they weren't on the best of terms, Paul and Taz at that time. I think Paul was still bitter over Taz leaving, and Taz didn't really want to do it. You know, Taz didn't want to go there. He didn't He didn't want to do the match. He felt like he had been there, done that, or he didn't feel like he could trust Paul, or he was ready to just move on with his career, or what was the thing? All the above. Okay. I think, I think all the above. And, you know, it's an uncomfortable situation when you're brought in, and, you, and, and it's an unknown, because here Mike Awesome is. He's under contract to the competition. Right. You know, they had Doug Dillinger show up with Mike Awesome, his security. At the at the event, uh, I don't even know if, if Mike dressed in the dressing room or, or what what they did, but it was that was another situation where Paul was in a bind, and he needed a big you know he needed a moment he needed a big fix, so what better what better way than to have the former champion come back, it's total shock, and beat this guy and send him on his way down south. So it was simply a favor to Paul. It was that was Paul's idea. Uh, any question on Vince's side about whether or not this was a good decision? Vince supported it. I, you know, I think there was the rumors and innuendo were all that. Oh my God, are they going to shoot on each other? Are they going to do this? They're going to do that. I, you know, I don't think that was ever really a concern. Uh, ever a concern or consideration. Um, we were confident in, in Taz being able to hand himself. Taz is a tough guy. You know, he's an amateur, knows what he's doing in the ring. And it just, you know, professionally, I just didn't see that happening. Right. So it was it was simply something to do to, to help ECW out at the time, help Paul out and and make our guy look good. Well, so from there, you know, I want to touch on it and we've talked about it before briefly in passing, but now a WWF contracted wrestler is the ECW world heavyweight champion. 
And soon after this show, this taping, you guys make the decision to put him in a SmackDown championship match, which is an interesting concept at the time because you've got the WWF champion taking on the ECW champion. Uh, but you're, you know, you're going to take criticism from ECW fans when you have triple H beat Taz. I just, I just want you to talk about it, whatever you want to say, and then we'll move on. <laughs> I know you're going to shit on everything I love. So go ahead. Okay. Um, no, I, it just made sense. It's why would you have him go over? Why would you have Taz go over? It why would you Triple book- H was the champion. He was the WWF champion at the time. And it's just the way we were going. It, it wasn't, it wasn't to shit on ECW or anything like that. It's just what it was. I understand the decision to not have Taz beat Triple H. I don't understand the decision to put either guy in that match. It seems unnecessary. It seems like by booking that match, you well, why not? I mean, CW. why not have it? it? It's a it's an attractive match. It's one of those kind of what ifs. What's going to happen? It's an interesting matchup. And anytime you can get something where the fans can't call the outcome, that's good booking. But, yeah, I get that. It's good booking from w, from the WWF standpoint. But don't you think it well, is? Both guys work for the WWF. But they're doing it with, and I know that you're going to say it's just a prop. But they're doing it with the ECW belt, and so to me, it seems like. It's a very selfish and short-sighted decision by the WWF because it doesn't help ECW, who you say that you need in business. You, you put their champion on national television, on worldwide television. So you give their belt worldwide exposure. How does that hurt them? Well, he lost. Okay. Why would so you- the, the alternative is, is don't put him on at all. Is is yeah. champion, so don't give them any promotion, well, anything at all that we're wrong? not what's, we're not going to reap the rewards of. Well, that's my question: is what's wrong with just booking him in a regular match, having Taz, you know, and have him beat a WWF guy? No, you could bring it. He could have defended an ECW guy or just a local enhancement talent, and then you get it on national television. But you don't necessarily hurt the ECW. Again, we brand. didn't we didn't own ECW. So, so just it wasn't that, it, that, that wasn't advantageous to us. Then why are you paying them every week? So that our talent would have a place to go for developmental. If so you, they would but, stay in business for if, talent to go in if between you bury the belt. Don't you see how that's even a little contradictory? Ken? No, I don't. I see by giving the belt exposure that it helps their brand. Even if the expo, even if it's, so let me ask you this. Why, when WCW was beating, I mean, like a drum, they were beating WWF. I'm going to know how many weeks I lost count. You guys lost so much. Uh, why didn't you just send Bret Hart over or Shawn Michaels over and let Hulk Hogan beat him? Uh, not for the belt or anything, but just beat him on nitro because that way he, your champion would have exposure on a much bigger show. We didn't have a working relationship with them. I would have tried to work one out. I mean, with this logic, it seems fucking foolproof. Maybe not. <laughs> I can't believe you don't see that that's contradictory at all. This is amazing to me. Because it's not. It is a lot. As Conrad often mentions, I only lasted a year in the WWF. But in my defense, the introduction of WCW elements into the WWF slash WWE organization often had negative results. Wouldn't you agree? That almost not quite matched the tragedy of my famed tenure. Who wrote this shit? The tragedy of my famed tenure. There are two stories where old WCW scores are revisited and settled in the WWE locker room. First, Goldberg against Chris Jericho, and then a battle between the father-in-law of my WHW co-host and another podcast co-host. Goldberg and Jericho get into some shit and have to be separated. After that April 7th raw, allegedly Goldberg was bad mouthing Jericho's selling ability to at least one other wrestler while backstage, according to one source. And this is from the torch hurricane overheard the conversation. And after prompting from Kevin Nash repeated it to Jericho who got worked up. So Jericho confronts Goldberg about the remark he made and the situation got physical. Jericho put Goldberg in a front face lock and held him there until the two were separated by wrestlers and agents. 
and eventually they shook hands before leaving the building. Goldberg had a reputation for having a short temper, but one of Wade's sources said that Goldberg handled it the right way. Quote, I don't think Goldberg was wrong on this. I just think Hurricane got Jericho all worked up and Jericho was determined to fight Goldberg because he was so worked up. The source also accused Helms of being a shit stirrer and claimed this was not an isolated incident. Goldberg had refused to work a feud with Jericho and WCW largely convinced by Nash who told Jericho who told Goldberg that Jericho was quote too small. Jericho grew frustrated since he felt he deserved that spot. And that was a major factor in his decision to leave WCW when the contract was up and he signed with the WWF. So before we get to what Jericho wrote in his book, did you see this happen? Did you hear about it? What'd you hear? I heard about it. I did not see it happen. No, I wasn't in the dressing room when they got into the fight. Definitely heard about it. You know, it's it's interesting the the hearsay and 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 so on and so forth of unnamed sources. You know, I I don't think it's right to talk, you know, if he's going to say something about Jericho behind his back and say it to his face. Somebody told Jericho if it was Hurricane, then it was Hurricane. I don't know. Hurricane <laughs> probably listening to this will probably tweet us and say, fuck yeah, I said that. Um, so, but Jericho confronted him. Jericho got in his face and confronted him. So you got something to say to me, say it to my face. And from all indications, Goldberg tried to say, no, I didn't say anything at first. And then the more Jericho pushed, the more, you know, Goldberg got up and, and Goldberg uh, grabbed Chris at first, I believe. And again, I wasn't there. I'm getting it all second and third hand too. And shove came. Goldberg charged Jericho and Jericho took him down with a a front face lock. And then they got pulled apart, you know, kind of much ado about nothing. But after all was said and done, it was Jericho that walked back into him and said, Hey, uh, is this going to end here now? (laughs) Or, you know, do we have to fight again? Well, I'd rather just, you know, move on and let's shake hands and move the hell on. And that's what I remember. And that was the story that I heard. Going back to, um, the WCW incident. Do you think that Kevin Nash just enjoyed keeping it stirred up too? I think Kevin definitely enjoyed keeping it stirred up and going, Oh my God, you're not going to work with that guy. Well, he could have sold that a whole hell of a lot better. So, you know, the guys do, they stick each other, especially if they know that they've got somebody that's going to bite. And if there's a sore spot, you just, yes. you just pick, 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 Big pick, time. pick. Yeah. Until they just explode. Yeah. We did that to a guy in our real life recently. You and I, who us. <laughs> yeah. Who Not me? I, you can always tell when somebody's full of shit, when their voice goes up like a few octaves, like who, what? Me? what are you talking about? I would never do that. The, You're crazy. <laughs> there you go. Here's what Jericho wrote. Goldberg was coming to the WWE. The announcement jackhammered through my stomach. The moment I heard it, uh, blah, blah, blah. Problem was, I don't think Goldberg really wanted to come to the WWE, but Rocky lobbied and convinced him until bill finally relented. I wasn't too keen on him coming in either. Since the last time I'd worked with him in WCW was a complete disaster, but I had no choice and decided to make the best of it. But on the first day he came up behind me and slapped him on the back, slapped me on the back as hard as he could. Hey, Chris, he said loudly and sarcastically, like he was Biff and I was McFly. I could tell he was still miffed about how things had gone down with us in WCW. I was willing to let the past stay there, but I made a promise to myself. I wasn't going to let this guy throw his weight around in the WWE the way he did in WCW. Coincidentally, a few minutes later, Vince asked me for a strange favor. We've got Bill Goldberg coming in and I want you to welcome him and help him out as much as you can. I don't know if Vince knew about my past with Goldberg. He'd never asked me to help anybody else before, but I told him I'd be happy to do what I could to help him adjust to the new environment. And I intended to do just that. Do you remember Vince sort of having a little birdie, put it in his ear that they had a problem and this being Vince's way of. Okay, children, y'all shake hands. <laughs> no, I, I don't know, um, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. And here's why I say that. I can see Vince doing that. Vince did the exact same thing to me and Bill Watts. Bill Watts and I had, had 
bad blood between each other. And so Vince was like, Bruce, I want you to take care of Bill, show Bill the way around and then help him out, give him a ride and do all this stuff. So I can, I hearing that for the first time now, I could see somebody going, you know, Jericho and, and Goldberg weren't the best of buds in WCW. And Chris might feel a little funny about Goldberg coming in. Great. I'll have him work with Bill and get them together. So Chris writes, it was Goldfinch's first raw. And I, I worked with triple H versus Sean and Booker T. And after the match, I was pulled aside and informed that Goldsmith had spent the entire match barking to Nash about how I didn't know how to sell properly and how I hadn't wanted to do business with him in WCW. And that pissed me off because I'd never had a problem selling for him or anybody else for that matter. I've always done business and it was business. I was trying to do when I wanted to put bill over properly in WCW, but it was obvious to me that he still had a chip on his shoulder. When it came to me, it made me mad that he'd only been with the company a little over a week and he was already up to his old tricks and it was time to put a stop to it right now. I marched straight into the dressing room and I saw Nash sitting in the corner, like a giant praying mantis acting like he owned the place. While Billy boy sat across from him with a self-indulgent smile on his face, throwing caution to the wind. I stood in front of him and stared directly into his eyes. I heard you were saying some stuff about me during my match. I don't know if you realize it, but things have changed. This isn't WCW. If you have something to say to me, say it to my face. Goldbug gave a shaky laugh and said, I didn't say anything about you. Bullshit. I know you did. Something snapped in the Burgermeister and he jumped to his feet. Oh yeah. What about all that stuff you were saying about me on the internet? (laughs) Internet, internet. Are you kidding me? I didn't spend enough time on the internet to check out club Jenna properly. Let alone talk shit about bill fucking gold. Eye. what are you talking about? A vein in his neck popped out like a worm. As he shouted back, Mike Tanay told me about the stuff you said about me on the internet. And I looked at him in disbelief and said, listen, Bill, it's simple. I could be your best friend in this company or your worst enemy. We're probably going to be working with each other at some point, And I could either make you look like a million bucks or make you look like shit. And you wouldn't know the difference. We're all here to make money and do business together. So just fucking relax. And Goldberg says, you never wanted to do the job for me in WCW. You're a prima donna. You're totally wrong about that. And before I could finish the sentence, goldfish grunted like a Neanderthal and grabbed me by the throat. Now, let me preface the rest of this story by saying I'm not the toughest man, nor would I've ever claimed to be. However, when someone puts their hand on my throat and begins to squeeze, it's time to throw hands. Am I right? Let's take a vote to make sure. Uh, once Goldster made his move, I reacted the only way I knew how I swatted his hand off my throat and gave him a two handed push to the chest. He rushed forward with his head down, trying to tackle me like the ex NFL lineman he was. And I stepped to the side, like the world's worst matador and gave him a front face lock. It was the only shoot hold. I knew that harkened back to my days bouncing at Malarkey's in Calgary. I think I surprised the shit out of him with my lethal hold and was able to power him down to the ground, applying pressure because I knew if I pushed his throat into his chest long enough, he might pass out. I really hope that he would go to sleep because I would, I was sure that he was going to fire back up and then kick the shit out of me. I mean, come on. Have you ever seen this guy? He's massive. I continued to hold my own and I couldn't figure out why he wasn't fighting back. I got a little lazy and released the pressure slightly. And suddenly he rolled on top of me. I was freaking out at this point, convinced he was going to eat me, but I held on to my patented front face lock. He starts bucking around like a mechanical bull, but surprisingly I was able to use his momentum against him and roll him over again. Yeehaw Jericho two, Goldie zero. It was like WCW all over again, except this time it was real. Well, eventually everybody separates them. Um, this is sort of not what you want to have happen on your second night in. What's Vince, ba- Vince McMahon's reaction to this fucking shit going down in the locker room? Not happy and, and pissed off. It's, you know, anytime that the children misbehave, you know, he's going to get angry and he doesn't want guys fighting in the dressing room, screwing up the dressing room. But same time, sometimes it's healthy. So, <laughs> you know, uh, Vince wasn't happy about it. He was glad that they went back. And they shook hands and they, you know, pretty much squashed it on their own. But 
it's it's silliness and for not good for Bill. You know, no matter what, you know, Bill's new. Jericho is has been there. Jericho's proven his weight, and it also boosted the stock of Jericho. Jericho's got coconut balls, and you know, yeah, he may not be the toughest guy in the world, but he's not going to back down from a fight either. And so, you know, I give him credit for having the balls to go get in Goldberg's face. So if you're wondering, it was broken up by Arn Anderson, Terry Taylor, Hurricane, Christian, and Booker T. As Jericho writes, Nash Mantis continued to sit in his chair in the corner of the room watching the festivities. <laughs> and they're sort of pulling Jericho off of him. Uh, and, and he's doing this after he's got his legs crossed around his midsection. And he's still got this front face lock. And they're sort of holding his arms behind him. And he realizes he's in a prone position. Uh, he's thinking he's going to punch me in the face. So he starts screaming, let go, let go. Eventually they do. But as they do, instead of punching him, Goldberg starts pulling his hair. What is it with wrestlers in scuffles in the back, pulling hair, Brett, Sean well, Goldberg and Jericho. Well, I'll tell you, you know, one thing about pulling hair is, is if you can control the head, you can control the body. So if you get a hold of somebody's hair and you get a good grip on their hair, you control their body. That's just fighting one oh one, man. That's that goes back from my, you know, um, three time black belt hall of fame. So right. we teach. So Goldberg being a martial arts guy, I would have taught him that. So once they're sort of separated and Jericho uh pie faces him as hard as he can and he stumbles back. And Jericho now has lost a handful of hair. Goldberg's probably been embarrassed. Jericho realizes I'm done with this fight. And he screams, what the hell is wrong with you, man? You're acting like a goof. And Goldberg replied, your mother's a fucking goof. And Booker T has the line of the day as he's chewing an unlit cigar. And he says, hold up. Did you just say his mother's a fucking goof? That's the worst insult I've ever heard, man. What should, what would Terry Funk have said that he should have said instead? Your mother's a whore. Be sure to check BrucePritchard.com tomorrow. And I'll have that. Your mother's a fucking goof shirt up. Um, <laughs> eventually they do settle down and, uh, Jericho walks back over to bill and says, matter of fact, like, here's the deal. You can shake my hand right now and we can forget about this or we can come to work and do this every single week. I don't give a shit either way. Goldberg looked him in the eye shook his hand and they called the truce. What a fucking story, man. You know, it's not, if this wouldn't have been Goldberg, this is a real question. If this would have been Funaki, is Funaki getting shit canned for getting in a fight in the locker room on his second weekend. It would have depend on what the fight was over. Yeah. I mean, but. It would, it, it would, it would really have to depend on, on what the hell was going on or how they resolved it. Does Vince have these guys have a meeting after the fact? Does he call them together? Does JR, is there ever any sort of repercussions or fallout or is it just a phone call? Everybody explains what it is and we move on. I'm sure that JR probably got both guys together and or separately and just said, are we good here? You know, made sure that we weren't going to have any more of this bullshit and they needed to move on. Anytime there's a skirmish like this, it's hard to really call it a fight. But when there's a skirmish like this, we all remember back in high school, everybody starts to talk about, oh, who won? And so there's this big vote amongst the witnesses of who won. In your opinion, who was everybody saying won this skirmish? Jericho. Did it sour any of the boys on Goldberg? Did it boost Jericho's sort of street cred amongst the boys? Well, it definitely boosted uh, Jericho and the, <laughs> I don't know if the line afterwards, your mother's a fucking goof. Uh, <laughs> you know, that pro that probably hurt more than anything, uh, than getting taken down and everything else. So, um, I just think that it, it helped Jericho and didn't, didn't help Goldberg at all. Uh, and there was no hype about the heat that Eric Bischoff had, man. He had creative issues with Jericho that caused him to leave. And ultimately we got Y2J. So roll tight on that. And he once threw coffee on Eddie Guerrero. Now Bischoff would deny that, but Eddie told the same story every time. 
and he even fired Stone Cold Steve Austin by FedEx because Steve was hurt. I'm sure there were others on the list. Do you remember any conversations with those specific guys about Bischoff coming in, Bruce? Uh, no. You know, everybody, it was a surprise for everybody as they came in. And like I said, everybody was professional and cordial with him. Again, they're on the winning side now. And he's coming in, you know, he's coming into their house as a talent. He's not their boss. So there's, there's real no reason to be confrontational or be an asshole in any way. Um, let's talk about someone who we know didn't like Eric Bischoff coming in and that's Ric Flair. They had a long sorted history at WCW and they're on good terms these days. And Bischoff has since apologized for the way he handled Rick and WCW. At one point they were both suing each other and Bischoff was even holding meetings in front of the boys saying that Flair never drew a dime in the business and that his new goal was to drive Flair into personal bankruptcy and ruin him. So even when Flair comes back several months later to WCW, these guys are not sending Christmas cards to one another. Do you remember having a conversation or talking to Rick about Bischoff coming back? No, I didn't specifically at all. And, you know, that may have been something Hunter might have, Stephanie may have, or Vince, but I did not. So I didn't know, you know, again, Rick was professional, as everybody was. And no one outwardly came up to me and specifically said, hey, I've got a problem with this guy being here. I don't like him. He screwed me. He did this. I didn't have any of that. So if they did, they might have said it to somebody else, but not me. Rick wrote in his book that his confidence was shot when he first started back with the company. And he even wrote, it seemed like I couldn't shake off the specter of Eric Bischoff. He later wrote, I just started to get a grip on my own talent. And then I saw Eric Bischoff walk through the dressing room at Continental Airlines in New Jersey. My heart sank. He says there was so much on my mind. However, I didn't know if I was ready to go walk through the curtain. He, he says that he had to have Brock calm him down and keep in mind, Brock is a 24 year old rookie who'd been on the road for four months, giving advice about how to handle this to the nature boy. Rick wrote, I had a thousand reasons for never punching out Bischoff in WCW. He was an executive. I had dragged my family through one lawsuit and I didn't want to get caught up in another, particularly one I would lose. But when I was alone, I think to myself, why didn't you just beat the shit out of him? And I blame myself for never doing it. Now he was in the WWE as a performer, no different than me or anyone else. I finally had my chance. Rick also writes that once Eric called him after 9-11 and tried to have a moment, but it just pissed Rick off even more. And he wrote, when he finally arrived in the WWE, I was forced to act cordial and it killed me. Finally, I told myself, I've let him get away for too long. If I want to raise my boys to be men, it's about time I act like one. So on March 17th, 2003, Rick says he saw him in the dressing room talking to someone about girls gone wild on his cell phone. And Rick wrote, I heard him use his classic cliche. It's taking on a life of its own. And that was it. Rick had had enough. He went to catering, got Arn and asked him to follow him. Then he told Arn, please just watch the door and didn't tell Arn anything else. So Rick makes the approach to Eric and says, I need to talk to you. Eric holds up one finger telling Rick to wait. But Rick wrote, I had already waited too long, so I just slapped him as hard as I could across the face, knocking the cell phone out of his hand. He began backing up. I swung at him three times, but it couldn't connect because he was moving so fast. When Bischoff got to the wall, I pushed him onto a couch, climbed on top of him, and pressed my finger against his eye and said, I could take your fucking eye out right now. I backed away so he could rise from the couch and said, let's go right now. Then Rick kicked Eric in the leg and suddenly Sergeant Slaughter was between them. And Eric said, I'm not going to fight you. Eventually, of course, Rick had to answer to Vince and explain himself. Vince wanted to know who else was involved and said this couldn't happen. As long as he was on company property, it was unprofessional. He asked him if there was anybody else he was planning to attack. And Flair said, Hogan, Vince said, please don't do that. Rick also wrote in his book that Eric tried to make peace several times since saying things like quote, Life is too short. Rick responded by saying he knows I'll never forgive him. Fuck. No. Rick says in the weeks that followed, a number of guys came to him to tell him they wish they'd done the same thing to Eric back in WCW. Now let's go to Eric Bischoff's book. He has a different account. Uh, he writes of all the guys at WWE. When I came over, Arn Anderson and Ric Flair were probably the only ones who were clearly not comfortable with me being there. 
but even they put it in their back pockets within a month, Rick and I were going out together and having a beer, Bruce, you were there. What happened? Because both of these accounts can't be true. Somebody's full of shit. Well, they were going out in a month and having a beer and, and as far as outwardly and between each other, they did put it in their back pockets and they were cordial and they did act professional with the exception of the one incident in St. Louis. So, and I wasn't there for the uh, incident in St. Louis. I was actually in Houston and I got a phone call from Jerry Briscoe because I always produced all the stuff with Eric and Rick and I was in Houston, uh, for some medical treatments and I was on my, I was going to St. Louis that night and I knew that I had everything with Eric and Rick that night and they had shit to produce together. And I got a phone call and it was, well, your two boys are acting bad. I said, what, what happened? And he says, well, Eric and Rick got into a fight in the locker room. I don't know what happened. They're in with Vince now. Have fun. See you in a few. <laughs> and I, I tried calling Rick. I tried calling Eric and uh, got messages. So I jumped on a plane and got there. And when I arrived, I don't know that I think they had gotten together with Vince and shook hands and everything was fine. But then I was told, well, you need to go get with Eric and Rick and go over the night. You know, nobody's had a chance to do that because of all the bullshit that happened earlier on in the day. I got them both in the dressing room in the back there in St. Louis. And both were as if nothing had happened. And I, gra I actually grabbed Rick first. I said, hey, Rick, everything cool? He says, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, man. It's over. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. And they walked in, got them together. We did business. And it was as if nothing had happened. Uh, did you know that this was going to happen at some point? No, I didn't. I, I really didn't because again, like I said, they, they were fine with each other in public. Was there any heat on Rick or Arn afterwards? You know, uh, I think that some people just kind of looked at it as a built up that pent up emotion and, and it was going to explode. Just needed to and get it over with. Needed to get, yeah, it's, it's like a pimple, man. It just needed to get out and move on. Since Rick wrote about it in his book, talk to me about Girls Gone Wild. <laughs> Girls Gone Wild was uh, a project, um, damn it, the guy that did Girls Gone Wild was a friend of Eric's. Francis. Yes. And they were doing a pay-per-view in wherever the hell it was, South Padre. So Eric... Uh, had come to Vince and said, Hey, there, here's this idea to do something with girls gone wild and do kind of a co-promotion where we do the production and everybody participate in the promotion. Snoop Dogg was involved in it. And this is where I don't think I've told this story before about Snoop Dogg and Kevin Dunn on the air. Have I, I'm not sure. Well, we go down and it's a, it's essentially a WWE production that is doing the production of this live girls gone wild competition in South Padre Island. And we've got a lot of different stars, probably the biggest one being Snoop Dogg. We have a lot of our production people down there and Eric and I believe Jason Hervey might've been involved as well. They're also down there on the production side, you know, writing this and being a big part of it. But the funniest story of it all, for those, everybody knows Kevin Dunn was the, is the executive producer for WWE, and Kevin was the executive producer for this. And Snoop Dogg, they were all warned ahead of time. They listen, the cops are going to be in, out in force. No drugs. When we say no drugs, that means marijuana too. Since apparently that's a drug. Apparently it's illegal in Texas. So the cops and the, the state troopers and all this shit had come in and said, Hey, if you know, we smell one damn, uh, joint, anything coming in, we're going to arrest people. And, uh, we see any underage people drinking, we're arresting them. This show's going to be done with. So Snoop shows up a couple hours late, rolls up billows of smoke coming out of the limo and so on and so forth. And as the legend goes, Kevin Dunn is beside himself because Snoop has missed all the rehearsals. He, he's showing up. They're getting ready to go live, and Kevin is trying to 
explain to Snoop what he's got to do for that night. And Snoop is just standing there staring off into the distance, puffing on a cigar. And Kevin is getting madder and madder because Snoop won't acknowledge him. And finally, Snoop, without ever looking at him, goes, hey, motherfucker, just because I ain't looking at you don't mean I ain't hearing you. I got this shit and fucking just walked off. But it was for the the crew, the WWE crew guys that were there and witnessed it. Two of them called me within 30 minutes of that happening because I was at home. I had nothing to do with the damn thing. And we're like, oh, my God, the greatest fucking moment ever. And Snoop Dogg just punked out Kevin Dunn. And Eric was there. And Eric, you know, would, would tell the story. But, yeah, that was the Girls Gone Wild debacle that uh, – I don't know if that made any money or not. Somebody did, not us. Hey, our last clip today features perhaps the best argument ever between Bruce and Conrad. Before we go there, I want to remind you of a couple of things because I'm going to take this moment to plug my shit. Number one is Conrad Thompson and I will be coming to St. Louis, Missouri at Off-Broadway this coming Saturday, the 22nd of June. That's going to be a 7 o'clock show at Off-Broadway. Tickets available at TonyandConradLive.com. We're going to be there for over two hours, meeting and greeting the fans, telling you many of the great stories that you may have heard on our podcast, What Happened When, or maybe missed out on. We hope you'll join us if you live in the St. Louis area. The very next day, Sunday, the 23rd of June, we're going to be in Baltimore at Jimmy's Famous Seafood. That's Baltimore, Jimmy's Famous Seafood, this Sunday, June 23rd at 1 o'clock. And we'll be bringing our show live there. Tickets available for the Baltimore show at whathappenedwhenlive.com. That's whathappenedwhenlive.com. So if you're out and about, if you get a chance to come out and see our live show, I know you won't be disappointed. So make sure you check us out. One other thing, for all my friends who like our stories, you can get more behind-the-scenes information, some great videos, some silly stuff that we do by logging on to our Patreon channel. That's patreon.com forward slash WHW Monday. Patreon.com forward slash WHW Monday. Hey, become a member and enjoy what happened when. All right, now to our last clip. Perhaps the best argument ever between Bruce and Conrad. The infamous clip comes from the infamous Austin Walks Out episode. It was one that appeared to get the two O's agitated at each other as it went on. Well, things finally came to a head. And some stacks blew when the topic turned to Scott Hall against Austin and whether or not certain actions were in bad taste. Apparently, Bruce and Conrad see things very differently on this subject. We've talked about this before, but this is the time where we see Austin uh, kind of kidnap Scott Hall and holds him hostage, ties him to a chair, gets him in a walk-in freezer, and is drinking beer. Uh, we should probably tell the story again kind of set the stage for what was going on that you didn't you guys didn't know but you discovered through the process of this segment well creatively austin had hall basically kidnapped and like i said taped up to an office chair and he also had his mouth taped he being scott hall and steve is in the back and he's running hall into different things and drinking beer and pouring beer on scott hall Obviously, we knew Scott Hall had issues, but what we didn't know was that Scott was taking a drug called Anabuse. And Anabuse is a drug that if you drink alcohol when you take it, it makes you violently ill. And that's obviously to curtail you and discourage you from uh, drinking any alcohol. So Scott's got his mouth taped and he's having beer poured on him and Scott starts to get sick and starts, the medication starts to have the reaction to the alcohol being poured on him. And it it was just a, it was a bad scene, but we, the, the worst part about it for me was being in that building till three, four o'clock in the morning, however the hell long it was reshooting all of that shit all night long because we were running long and Vince wanted to come back and produce all of that stuff. And, and it just became a nightmare. It was a, it was a nightmare all the way around. We, it became a Vince McMahon production all night long. Can we just say what a fucked up business professional wrestling is where you've got a guy who's had some, some substance issues in his life and is working very hard 
to steer clear of all that. And in a company where you can literally create anything you want, we create a scenario where that guy has to drink alcohol, but he is so job scared. And it's such a culture where he doesn't feel like he can speak up because it will be viewed as weakness or he may lose his spot that he knowingly ingests something that is going to make him sick, but he would rather do that than lose his. So what a fucking weird business. I mean, well, it, I don't know. I don't know that he knew beer was going to be poured on him. And I don't know that he knew he was going to have that kind of reaction. So I, you know, which makes it even worse. I don't know. That's true. It makes it even worse. You guys know that he's I, struggling. We didn't know he was on. We didn't know he was on that. You didn't, How would we know? You didn't know that he had substance issues and that he was an alcoholic. We do have substance issues. So let's pour beer but if you on can't, it. But if you, yeah, but if you can't get, no, that, that's well, not fair either. How is that, it not fair? If then I went, get out of the business if you can't handle it. Listen to you. See, what a fucked up business this is. Okay. I can't believe but that. It is was, what it is. I can't believe that was your attitude. This is a guy no. who has an addiction tra- problem and you know is working hard to get clean. And just to be a dick, you guys want to pour beer on him. And then your attitude is, well, if you can't handle it, get out. No, I'm saying based on your argument, I'm saying that if you come into the business and he knows what he's getting into, and if that's a problem, whoa, then whoa, speak whoa, up. Whoa, 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 You just said two sentences ago, Jack Dick, that he didn't know he was getting beer poured on him. You guys knew he was an alcoholic and you poured beer on him as a surprise out of your own mouth right there. No, it wasn't a surprise. No, you're you just said completely he didn't know. taking it out of context. How should I take you're it? In the mo- you're in the moment. Steve pours beer on him. Shit happens sometimes, okay? But we didn't know he was on an abuse. Didn't know he was going to have that kind of a reaction. Didn't know he was taking medication. Knew he, he was knew he alcoholic. was working with Austin who had that anyway. gimmick. If he had a problem with it, he could have spoken up. You are, you, you know, Jim Cornett has you pegged when he calls you the artful dodger. Because I just said a minute ago, never mind. You're a turd for saying that, by the way. No, I'm not. It's a simple fact. If you, if you have a problem with it, speak up. You just said and, a minute okay, ago. You know what? We, I don't want to do this. Okay. We won't do it. We'll do something different. But based on your argument, what you said is, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Woe I'm, I'm is so me. sad. I'm so pathetic. Everyone should feel sorry for me because uh, I had to, I'm sorry. We put you through uh, rehab. How many times? Wait, 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 wait. We're helping Scott, you with all of Scott this. Scott Hall never ha- threw a pity party and said, I can't do this. No, you did. Me. No, I said, what a fucked up business it is that you guys know he's struggling with that and you still pour beer on him. That's what I said. You, you can't act like that. You didn't know that he had that problem. If your next sentence is look how many times we put him in rehab. Now look at him. Let's just cover him in beer. That's a dick move, Bruce. No, it's not. Oh, if you can't handle it, get out of the business, pussy. You can't handle that, then do something different. What does that mean? Just what I said. If you can't handle it, you don't want to do it, you don't want to be put in that position, then don't put yourself in that position. How does he know he's in that position if y'all don't tell him? You just said when he shows up to work. So when you show up to work, (laughs) on this show. Move on. Okay. We've already just, we've already covered this in the uh, NWO show. Yeah. And you're still as big of a dickhead now as you were then. Thank you. Golly. What else you want to talk about? Go on. I'm done. I got nothing else. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Hear more of this dumb shit about the NWO and WWE in our archives. Of course, we all know, uh, more. Uh, nonsensical horseshit happened. It was all awful. Nothing was good about it. And uh, Austin was as frustrated as we are right now with Bruce. Thanks for tuning in to the best of something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard this week. I'm Tony Schiavone. And I want to invite all of you to listen to Conrad and I every week on What Happened When. It drops on Wednesday. For those of you on Patreon, it drops on Monday. We have a great time. We think you will too. And hey, today's Friday. We would love to see you this weekend on tour in St. Louis and Baltimore. I'm Tony Schiavone, and I'm desperately out of time, just like Bruce's back molar. Turo is the largest car sharing marketplace in the world where you can book any car you want from a community of trusted hosts. From exotic sports cars to pickup trucks, Turo has the widest selection of cars available anywhere 
for whatever occasion. Download the Turo app. That's T U R O on the App Store or Google Play or visit turo.com. Get $25 off your first trip when you sign up with the promo code WrestleJune at checkout. Terms apply. <laughs> 